everybody? This is Rob Live back with you again today. I got the Rob Live shirt on, got the swag on. Um, as always, we're always looking for great guests to come in and share with me and Jim everything that they're doing in this world. And you always have this bucket list of people that you want to make sure you get a chance to talk to and have them share their message. And this man has been on my list for a long time, even before the show existed. I said, man, I've got to just pick his brain. And I'm going to quickly summarize what we're talking about and introduce him. But essentially, this person has allowed, in my opinion, more people from the Central Valley than I've ever heard of uh, help them find that path to Ivy League schools more than anyone I've ever known. If there's someone else there that can uh, take that record, uh, I, I challenge them to come forward. But until then, we have him right here in the studio with us, Mr. Marti Mares with the Ivy League Project. That's right. Ivy Thank League Project. <laughs> but we're shaking, baking, turning, and burning. We say don't be a pretender, be a contender. Yeah. <laughs> see, and that's the other thing. He has all these cool things that he says all the time. Every time I see you post on Facebook, it's uh, it always finishes with network baby. Network baby, there you go. Uh -huh. And I can I can hear you saying it yeah. as you do that. Um Martin, I want to start from the beginning as always. Um you are from Parlier, correct? Yeah. So I, I attended pa Parlier Schools, Parlier High School, class of nineteen seventy seven. Go yeah, Panthers. Yeah, go Panthers. Go Panthers. Uh the and, blue uh, and yellow from uh, blue and gold. Blue and gold. Blue and gold. You cut Not me regular out. yellow. It's gotta be no, gold. No, it gotta be you gotta cut me, it's blue and gold, baby. <laughs> there you go. Bleed blue and gold. And I went on I head, head on over to uh, Fresno City College. Yes. Uh from Fresno City College over to, to Fresno State. A quick quick story. I, I saw this girl on this newspaper and I uh, I said, you know what? That girl's going to be my girlfriend. And so I saw the picture, and I said, she ended up going to city. I ended up going to city college. I met her. Said, you know, um, ended up dating her there at city college. <laughs> Didn't marry her, but I dated her. You saw her in the paper, <laughs> and then you dated her. Yeah. Uh, can, can we get a name? Uh, we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it confidential. <laughs> like, you like that, Jim? He's like, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, on the down low. Uh, yeah. So that's awesome. Okay, so you 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 have experience with just manifesting. Things that you see, and then I'm a person of purpose. I I take care of business, right? I yeah. I just I'm like a bulldog. If I see something I like, uh, I'm gonna go and, and pursue it. Uh, especially my educational goals, coming from a large Latino family, I was very fortunate to have six older sisters that all went to college and graduated. Oh wow! Uh, and that was amazing coming from a uh, all Latino uh, community. No, shout out to your parents. Yeah, Good job. yeah. Uh, uh, interesting story. My uh, my dad used to. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, six, seven years old, we, my dad would come home, my mom would come home, I would grab their, their baskets, and my dad would sit in the sofa, and I would take his shoes off, and my dad used to say, mijo, no seas que, no quiero que seas uh, burro como yo, don't be a donkey like me. I go, tienes que ir al colegio, you need to go to college, right? So even at an uh, early time, you know, in my, in my life, uh, my father, a uh, great role model, who has my mom, uh, uh, expected us to go to college, and, and because my sisters had gone, right? And I already knew in third grade that I was going to go to college. I just didn't know what college was. Wow. I just knew it was a place for a, a higher learning. There was a lot of books. My sister would come home yeah. on weekends, and you know we, they would study and so on. So, um, are you guys? Are you first generation? I am first generation. My uh, my family. Uh, my dad uh, was actually uh, my mom was from Mexico, um, mm -hmm. and my dad was born here but raised in in, um, in in Mexico. He would go back and forth as a migrant because at an early age. Uh, my grand my grandparents took him out of school and went to go work in the fields and so on. Wow! But he had an early uh, how education. far did his education the go? Third grade. My mom sixth grade. So your father had a third grade education. Mm -hmm. Your mother had a sixth grade education. Right. Ex but you and all your siblings were college graduates. All all uh, with with bachelor's or master's degrees. Wow! Right. Do you ever ask? Did you ever have a chance to ask your parents like, where did you get this vision for us? To be? I think it was because of my grandfather. My grandfather um, was a self learner. He uh, learned English. He was born in 1886 and jumped on a uh, on a train, uh, and because he wanted to go to El Norte, and uh, decided that uh, you know that's the rain of, rain of gold, and I'm going to go and work and work in the fields. And over there in Mexico, you only make a few dollars. And he came to L.A. and he was yeah. making a lot more dollars, right? And yeah. he eventually came out of the valley and started working in the fields here and and uh, brought up the family. But when he was in L.A., he was uh, grandfather was a bootlegger. He would make uh, uh, wine and, and beer. Oh, really? <laughs> he had a speakeasy <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Something. But uh, he's a pretty smart guy. He taught himself how to read and how to how to read and, and speak English and 
and so on. So you it know, sounds like he was the guy. visionary. Like I think so. I mean, being the fact that you're only 14 years of age and you jump on a, oh, a top of a train. I was thinking much older. Yeah, you no, know, he's wow. born in 1886, and in 1900 he decided to jump on a plane at 14 years of, on a train at 14 years of age and to come work in the fields in, in uh, Los Angeles with strawberries and things of that nature. Now, uh, then he built a family here, of course. He, yeah, but actually in L.A. and back and forth, he would migrate to, uh, okay. to Delicias, Chihuahua, and, and also to uh, to L.A. Then eventually over here to Salmon Parlier. Salmon Parlier, uh-huh. agriculture, yeah. field ag, work. Ag field work and so on, yeah. So then your parents settled eventually in Parlier and built a family there? They did, they did. Uh, six lived girls? In a, lived and in a small ranch, six, six girls and myself, and... At a very young age, um, my mom tells me that uh, these two men came to the house, knocked on the door. Uh, they said, you know, we see that your house in, is in, is in uh, despair, right? Uh, needs a repair. And uh, asked her if she would be willing, for they would be willing to fix it. And yeah. mom says, you know, with limited amount of income, that, you know, we work here for the rancher. You know, trabajamos para el ranchero. And so um, they didn't have the means. And they saw a baby in a cuna in the crib and they looked at the baby and the baby boy and they said that baby because of in our culture and our religion we believe that when the hair is sticking up that baby is going to be somebody very important so at a very young age my mom uh, uh, i was that baby my mom at a very young age spoke words of affirmation and validation to me telling me mijo tu vas a ser una persona muy grande muy importante so at a very young age, I would jump on her lap and say, Mom, tell me the story again, who I'm going to be. And my mom would tell me over and over. And, uh, uh, and, and so at a very young age, I had a great self-esteem. I knew I was going to be like a state leader, a world leader, somebody very important because yeah. my mom kept addressing and sharing that expectation with me. And so with my sisters telling me, hey, in third grade, you're going to go to college, right? I'm like, Okay, you know, when my friends didn't even know what college was, yeah. I had a perspective what what college was. Plus, my dad used to read, being the newspaper, and I used to read the paper, usually the sports page, and le- later on the the local news and the, you know the front page news and so on. But uh, very fortunate to have you know, parents that were very loving, very caring, and uh, wanted the best for us. But I worked at a at five years old, six years old. I was working in the fields with the family. I mean, wow, those that young. in those days. Uh, the, the whole families would go in, you know, in a, in a, we had a station wagon and you know, yeah. all 10 of us would all go and, and work in the fields and, and go pick grapes. And, you know, it was the Madises versus the Floreses and the Rodriguez's and all that. So my dad was like, you know, like, well, put out there, muchacho, hurry up. Vamonos. Yeah. And so my dad was like, man, I, and I got stuck with my dad. My you dad got paid had by the pound, right? Actually, it was tabla. Yeah, it was a oh, yeah, the the, 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 grapes. it was a tray, a, a, a brown tray, a paper you put on there, and then you you put all the grapes, and then somebody had to fix them and take the leaves out. But my dad didn't have one one pan; he had two pans. So he he had one that was full. I would pick it up and then throw it um, on the on the uh, tabla uh, paper, and then he had another one. As soon as I turned around, he had another one. So this I'm five, six day. years old, brother. All day I'm, <laughs> I look at the sun and the end of the row. I'm like, oh my god, one day. <laughs> Hopefully we get done today early, you know. <laughs> but I tell you, I, I learned to be an industrious worker and to be focused. Where my kids, some of my friends were kind of lazy and not focused. I was like, okay, what's next? Because I was in charge of the paper, the water. Um, at a very young age, I had a lot of responsibility. So, you know, I had fun. I we, we, we rode bikes and, you know, we... Uh, um, I hung out with swim the kids. In the ditch. Uh, yeah, swimming in the ditch. Gym. And, uh, swim in the ditch. Swimming in the ditch. That's yep. right. Got you. Got you. Right. That's you a rite of passage yep. here that, in the that valley. That was a rite of passage <laughs> in the valley. That's right. In the in the canal. Sounds like you were groomed for greatness. Uh, you know what? I I just thank God that He's given me um, a lot of great opportunities, especially coming from a great family. Yeah. And so you know, going to City College, where my sister went, and then to Fresno State, and um, at, at City College, it was interesting. My my professor. Um, asked me, Martin, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, what do you mean? Well, you shouldn't be here. I'm like, really? Well, what are you talking about? He goes, you're too smart, Martin. You should be at a UC. Or, and I'm like, wow, well, I came here because I saw that girl in that newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I just kind of like City College. It was you're driven. It was, it was really neat. I, yeah. saw, I got the first time. I got to hang out with. People that were Anglo and, and African Americans and Japanese and Chinese because 
in Parlier, it was very limited. There was not that yeah. many Anglo kids and, and Japanese kids. They were come of my class. But it, it going to Fresno City, I said, you know, uh, how do I compete a, 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 in comparison to the kids that are from uh, Fresno schools and, and Clovis schools? I yeah. didn't know my level of intellectual curiosity and my standard of, 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 uh, of producing and, and doing well. So yeah. uh, at school, I, I would study, you know, three to, to five hours a day. Because I wanted to do well, meet the honor roll, the dean's best. list, yeah. all that, you know, all the accolades and so on. But uh, again, you know why? I'm freaking focused, right? I am, <laughs> I am focused. I'm going to get the job done, right? Uh, well, here's the thing that I wanted to point out that, uh -huh. that you mentioned. Um, and I think that a lot of parents out there, parents, listen to this one real quick. The, the kids don't necessarily have to start something for the same reason that they finish it. Right. So let's say, for example, Martin's case, he saw a girl in the paper. <laughs> he wants to go to school where the girl in the paper is at. But that's just the initial interest. Right. Oh, I yeah. started yeah. as a soccer player because yeah. I wanted to continue my soccer career after high school. So I went to junior college. Yeah. That was the carrot for me. Right. But then after a while, right, you realize you can't you can only go so far with that. And then other interests start to get peaked along the way. Yeah. So parents do not hit the panic button if your kids like, "Mom, I want to go to this school cuz they got a cool mascot." <laughs> Eventually, yeah. through that process, they will find their way, like Martin. Right. You know, I at, being at City College, um it was an experience cuz we were the farm worker kids from from a small little rural community of Parlier, right? Yeah. There was only 80 kids in our class. And did you have a chip on your shoulder a little bit about that? Uh, not I mean, well. did, like, I'm because I, I feel like the small town kids uh -huh. um, tend to have more of a of a like, hey, you know, we, we, we can keep up with the rest of you guys. Oh, yeah. Like, just because we're from a smaller yeah, community. Just because you're from a smaller town doesn't mean that. Uh, yes. And that all the you assumptions have, you have that to have come lower with expectations. It. And I'll share a little bit more about the Ivy League project and some of my students that come from that came from a, a small, you know, small high school. And yeah. yet they're. They're being accepted and graduating and, and with honors at places like Harvard and Yale and Brown. I think it's so like important, like, like, for example, in your case, there was a man who came to your home and dubbed you as special, mm -hmm. right? Because the hair was standing up yeah. on his head and they said, that guy's special. And so then from then on, your mom's, she you know. She grew me. She's great. Hey, she spoke special, words of affirmation. spoke word affirmation. And that's so important. And, and mm -hmm. Martin, I have a big issue sometimes with the language that certain groups, cultures, families, will have you, will be using inside the home. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. Um, I come from a Mexican family, and all of our nicknames by nature are derogatory. Aye. We call each other feo, gordo, tonto, right? Cabezon, right? Translation, right? Ugly, big head. Uh, fat, right? These are the, yeah. and, and um, even though they're in jest and, and, and supposed to be, you know, like a, a fun or right. the subconscious effect it's having on our kids, we're confused why we have low self-esteem. And, and I think that plays a part. Yeah. Whereas in other families that kind of have figured it out, you know, it, it, it gets labeled as corny sometimes, but I've been around families, Jim, I don't know if you have, but where they speak, power into their kids like hey daughter you have a great day you're you're, you're a blessed child of god mm -hmm. and in in our mind because we didn't grow up like that we're like oh that's pretty corny like, yeah. like it's foreign to us and i want to change that one of the things that i i do when i speak at seminars i speak all over the, the country mostly mostly uh southwest uh, states yes but i i have a session where i talk to parents about the fact that uh that your words are power and uh you know use social media to your advantage by using a, a, a positive story, a positive quote, uh, a Bible verse, uh, where I would send texts uh, to my kids. Uh, and so when they wake up in the morning, they have a text. And it's a text from dad, right? Yeah. Or it's a little note in their lunch, in lunch box. Say, you know what? I love you. You're, you mean the world to me. You're important, right? And, and so if, if we're strategic and we're, and, um, we're strategic in terms of we're affirming our students, our kids are going to come out you know, thinking very, very positive about themselves. Yeah. And, and schools, you know, I was a, as a teacher 
Uh, I was a, um, a principal, assistant superintendent, acting superintendent. Did basically everything. Today I'm the so you board went president. from teacher all the yeah. way to superintendent. So I'm the board president today, right? In Parlier. Is all of this in Parlier? Your, in in your Parlier, career? yeah. Most of my life was in Parlier. I did, uh, I think, two years in Madeira and one uh, one year at uh, Delano as a AP okay. uh, assistant principal. But uh, most of my life has been in Parlier. But um, the, what I do with my own kids, right? Uh, and as I I always affirm them. Um, sometimes when they're leaving the kids or in the classroom, you know, I want you to tell me something you learned, something positive you learned today. Um, I want you to turn to each other and say something positive to each other. Today in the Ivy League project, I tell them the first thing we do when we enter, uh, and I want you to uh, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor that you are destined for greatness. And so each person tells each other, then say they turn to themselves and point to themselves, says, I am destined for greatness. And so yeah. I tell them what destin means and, and what greatness looks like. Uh, and uh, maybe a video of, of Michael Jordan, right? Or it could yeah. be a, a different star uh, that demonstrates hard work. But it's about, it's, it's about affirming. You have, to, you have to speak words of positive. I think uh, your, uh, your last, uh, one of your guests, uh, Susie Q, talked about that, that whole mindset. Uh, and it's a mindset of, of believing. It's also speaking words of faith, of speaking words uh, toward um, your, your outcome, what do you want to do? And having that goal written down, I'm going to go to Fresno State, I'm going to become a doctor, I'm going to do this and that. And you not just, you're not just talking about it, but you're also working on it, but you're also, you have a visual, uh, visual uh, word picture of what you're going to look like in the future. That's, That's important. No, it's very important. Yeah. I, I heard a story once. I don't know if you saw this one online. Jim, do you remember this one about Spider-Man? Okay, no. so the kid playing Spider-Man now, younger guy, uh -huh. right? Because, you know, they switched up a few oh, yeah. Peter Parkers. Uh -huh. Well, the one who's playing Spider-Man now, he was in a movie about 10 years ago, and his, his uh, acting partner at the time was Robert Pattinson, who eventually became Batman, okay. right? Okay. He's a, he was a Twilight kid, the, 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 the key vampire in Twilight. Okay. Well, they were both, he didn't have Twilight yet. He didn't. He did not have Spider Man. Yeah. It, this was all before all that, and they're doing a movie together. They're in the middle of the desert, right? And so this movie, there's a lot of scenes where they're just isolated. It's the two actors and then the cameras. And he says, "I'm out here with this kid, and, and we're, you know, we're doing this." And Tom Holland is his name, the kid, and it's one of his first big movies. And he says he had on a full Spider Man outfit underneath his clothes, right? And he's like, bro, like, why are you wearing the Spider-Man outfit? <laughs> he was manifesting. Oh, there we go. This is 10 years before yeah. he auditions for the yeah, part. He was going to be the part. He, part I'm going to be the next Spider-Man. There you go. Yeah, he's barely, he's barely got his first acting gig. But Robert Pattinson was witness to this and wow. told this story on a talk show. And that's how deep this thing is. And I think parents, you know, sometimes, and even kids, we underestimate it. I know growing up for me, words of affirmation were like a corny thing. Uh -huh. There was a Saturday Night Live used to have this guy named Stuart Smalley, and he would look into the mirror and he'd say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and dang it, people like me, <laughs> right? And so we would laugh at that and go, oh, that's corny stuff. So anytime someone tried to be speak affirmation, yeah. especially as a cool teen, I was like, oh, that doesn't sound real. But if you insulted me, I was like, oh, that, that's, that's pretty accurate. It was real backwards, right? Wow. But the person who saved me, my mother. Because just like your mother, she would tell me that I was capable of many big things. And even more so, probably in your case as well, she would go out and do these things. My mom's been in a couple of movies. Mm -hmm. She got me into a movie. I'll show you that. That's, I heard, that's later. I heard a little bit about the yeah. background. But that's, that's all her doing. And so not only did she speak it, she went out and did these things. And so I believed her when she told me that I was destined for greatness. Mm -hmm. But not every child has that. Yeah. Jim, who was your cheerleader? Um, in high school, was it mom, dad, friend? Well, mom was always there. Mom was always there. In fact, I had a lot of kids that came up. You know, uh, your senior last football game. Yeah. You know, when the parents come out with the roads and stuff. My dad came, and they're like, "Dude, I didn't even know you had a dad, bro." <laughs> I'm like, "What?" And he goes, "You know, they were just like, oh, he, didn't, he wouldn't go to anything, right?" He yeah. would come to my tennis games and stuff. What was and, his mindset behind that? Uh, my work. I got to oh. work. Yeah, I got to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dad's. Yeah. Yeah. I got to provide. But yeah. um, uh, yeah, and then and then uh, my leadership teacher in high school, he he became like the the mold 
of all of us growing up and stuff. And Rosie like, High. Yeah. Cardinal. Yeah, yeah. What was so, his name? Mr. Brown. Jeff Brown. So Shout out to but, Jeff uh, Brown he, for believing in he, uh, Jim. Look at Jim now. He's so... Uh, um, but I wanted to add to something you said earlier uh-huh. is um, when you tell a kid... I don't know, Robert, you've done this before, but so... And it's kind of a sidebar to what you're doing, what you were referencing, is say you have a meeting and you're going to tell everybody, hey... I need everyone to come to my classroom at this time. We're going to all talk about and discuss sub- something, right? I've done. I did that before one time when I first started teaching. Maybe one person came, and I was expecting fifteen, twenty. Yeah. And I was like, why did no one come? It was verbal. So then I had, all right, I'm going to make them sign their name. So they signed their name that they were coming. They still really actually didn't come. They didn't get credit if they came or not. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, I had 20, 30 people come later. You know, I realized this down the line. And I asked, like, oh, what made you come? Well, I signed my name. And I think it was a conscious thing that they signed their name to something. Yeah. And so now they actually had to commit to something, even though it was irrelevant if they came or not. It was just we're going to talk about what we're going to sell for our fundraiser, Mm -hmm. you know, or something. So, but it was kind of interesting. If you told somebody, sign your name on the dotted line on this application for a job that you, are thriving for is that going to commit them mentally to to kind of it's almost like brainwashing them or you know convincing yeah. them in a way to where they could uh commit to something so but it was an interesting type but if they if you didn't do anything like that verbally you just told them you're, you're going to succeed you're going to succeed it's too and mom and dad have to tell you you're going to succeed <laughs> it's almost it's it's you know it's a third party person right. that if, the, if another yeah. person says then it means more there, there was this uh teacher at parlier high school her name was Miss Verl Smates, uh, and Miss Verl Smates was like this, uh, the ultimate uh, teacher. At, you know, she had straight A's uh, at USC. She had like forty-one uh, straight A's, uh, alpha, alpha g- gamma, everything, right? Yeah. Uh, and science and, and math. And I remember one day going to her, and and it was an algebra freshman year, and um, I said, Miss Smates, I, I can't do it. I, I can't do this problem. And she said, Martine. It's not that you can't, is that you don't know how. There's a big difference between can't and don't know how. I want you to wipe that word can't from your vocabulary. Oh wow. And so Powerful I stayed moment. I stayed with her. I got straight A's in, in algebra. Uh, I was not the the brightest and I was not the lowest, but I was probably one of the hardest working kids in my class, right? Yeah. Uh, and I remember that when I would get A's and the rest of the kids would turn around like Marty, you got an A? <laughs> I go, yep, but I stayed after school. But why? I was a hard worker. I wanted to do well in school. I wanted to make my parents proud and and uh, to compete. You know, again, I I'm used to competing. You know, yeah, very very important. So, I want to f- know this. You go through your own education. You get educated. Now you come back to Parlier. Mm-hmm. At what point do you say? I need to find a way to get more Central Valley kids into Ivy League schools. What, what's the, what? Well, so let me share the story. What yes. happened? Um, I I was a teacher. I was the gate eight G A T E teacher. Oh, gifted and talented. Gifted and talented teacher. Yeah, and, I was a uh, gate kid. Were you a gate kid? Yeah. I, I last about two years. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing a conference, right? A junior high school at Parker Junior High, and. My buddy says, uh, fellow teacher said, hey, Martin, why don't you think about getting Ruben Navarrete? I go, who is he? I go, he just graduated from Harvard, and um, uh, he's in town right now. I can I can ask him and his dad. I know his dad real well. Is I'm he like, from Parler? No, he's from Sanger. Ruben? Okay. Ruben, Ruben Navarrete. He actually, he's the most syndicated Latino writer in the country now. Oh, wow. Uh, number Ranked number 13 in the whole country. Does he still live here locally? I know. He lives in, he lives in uh, Carlsbad. 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 So... Uh, we have this uh, conference, and then um, uh, Ruben uh, speaks to the group, and then afterwards says, Martin, why don't we take some kids to Harvard? I'm like, Harvard? Just like that. He just uh, yeah, threw it out he just there. says, yeah, why don't we go Real to- matter of fact. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, Ruben, partner kids don't go to Harvard. We go to really college. He's like, You're COS, COS, COS. Really? Fresno State, right? <laughs> I'm like, what the heck are you thinking? Are there any Mexicans at Harvard? Right? Yeah. I don't know anybody, any Mexicans. That ever gone, to, you know, from our area over to yeah. Harvard, right? I'm like, that's like the other side of the world. Yeah. Um, I think, Different you know, country. If it was the smartest kid, I think, that from part of the area we went to was, I think, UCLA or Berkeley, right? That was like, 
Uh, one, 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 uh, one person every 200 years, right? <laughs> uh, but the, the, uh, at that point, at that time, it was, uh, you, you didn't hear about kids going, right? We were, we were uh, uh, encouraged to go to the local junior college, Wheatley yeah. College, right? When, yeah. when the three of us the decided Italian. to go to Fresno City or Fresno State, I was like, wow, you're going to the big city. <laughs> the big city of Fresno, right? Yeah. Get an apartment and live together. How do you wash clothes, you know? Uh, bring them home on, on weekends and mama, me puede lavar la ropa. Okay. So where Ruben comes around and I'm like, Ruben, I, are you like freaking crazy? Uh, talk to me more. He goes, no, Martin, let's let's do it. I'm like, oh my God. I go, I've never been there, but yeah, you know, a man, if we don't go to Boston, I, I want to see the South State Stadium, right? Uh, I'm a I'm what, a, what I'm a big What year is this Lakers. happening? This is a, a 1992. 92, 92. Okay. Uh, Rubens, wow. Rubens comes around and You're after I graduated talks and uh, um, we, we so we decided to take uh, uh, talk to the the Godfather, uh, Mr. Jose Espinosa, and said, Mr. Espinosa, I'd like to take some kids with you uh, to from Parlier to over to the East Coast. Would you be willing to support that? And he goes, Yeah. So what do Martin? We'll we'll support you. They provided a gas card. I think. Were uh, you kind of shocked? Man. Oh, I was first, shocked. Like, he said, Yeah. Oh, yeah, he said yes. Yeah. So I'm like, what the? What well, you heck? know what though? I want to stop you for a second because uh-huh. this is a very important thing for people to understand, and I think Jim Jim would agree with this. You've always got to have somebody around you who says Im- seemingly impossible things in a very matter of fact way. You know, hey, let's take them to Harvard. Mm-hmm. Uh, let, let's build a studio. Yeah, yeah we should start a, a podcast. You know, just like it's got to yeah. be very. And, and my brother was that guy for me. Yeah. And he would just say, hey, I'm going to sell gym memberships at the gym. I'm not going to get a regular job. So there he is at the gym selling memberships, right? Yeah. Creating his own jobs. Wow. And so this was your guy. Yeah. Yeah. Navarrete was a mover. He was a, he was a, a visionary thinker. I had never yeah. met anybody like him. This guy was like thinking outside the box. 360 degrees, not 180, 360. And so when things would fall into place, was he just like, yeah, that's the... Oh, he came around. I said, "Okay, Ruben, if we if the, the the president said yes, but if we go, I need you to help me in every aspect, because I think I had only been on a plane one time in my life. Oh, yeah. So here I was going with a female counselor, taking I think it was eight kids. Who were these first eight? How did uh, you they pick them? They were all. There was two eighth graders and six high school students. Most of them were like freshmen and sophomores, and then uh, the the counselor's uh, daughter and another student from a different district. Right? They. They're all like, oh, can we go too? I'm like, well, how many people does the van, the van uh, fit? It fits 10, right? Six yeah. students, the two chaperones, and the two extra kids from other towns. So I'm like, let's, let's rock and roll. Uh, let's shake and bake, you know? Let's go to the East Coast, right? <laughs> let's let's raise some money. <laughs> so we decided to go. We were supposed to go in the, in the, I think, in the spring. We went, no, in the fall. We went in the spring. And, and uh, we only went to Harvard, MIT, and, and uh, Yale. Uh, we fly Only, there. Those are like the, oh, yeah, those well, are the premier spots. Well, yeah. Well, about that time. <laughs> MIT. Uh, yeah, MIT. And, and, uh, we are know, they all in, I know Massachusetts, but you got where Cambridge else? and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you have uh, Boston, uh, I mean, uh, Harvard in, in Cambridge and uh, uh, MIT all in, uh, in, in Boston. You know, it's funny. We always say the names of these places, but we never really talk about the town. Like yeah. there's some Ivy Leagues that you'll tell mention today. Uh-huh. I won't know what town they're in. Yeah, I just know the name. Yes, right. And so anyway, we go and I I I didn't know there was uh, Latino admission officers. There was one admission officer named oh. Aurelio Ramirez who was uh, uh, the uh, admission officer Latino. And um, you're like you exist. We were yeah we were there and at that time we stayed we bought our own sleeping bags. Right. Oh, okay. So yeah. all my kids with sleeping bags. Imagine you know in the uh, uh, airport we we have uh, sleeping bags. Um, and uh, we slept on the student dorms, uh, in the dorms, right? And so we, uh, I included myself, right? We, we all stayed right there the to save, save money. At that time, it cost like $650, right, uh, yeah. for everything. And then I, I didn't know, we, we didn't have, you know, Siri to say, Siri, take me to MIT. It was like, open the map. Where are we at? <laughs> I think we're right here. Yeah. Where are we at? And they're all laughing and giggling. And we we're like, Oh my God, you guys are driving me crazy. For younger people watching this episode, <laughs> maps used to be made out of paper, like a treasure pirate map. <laughs> and you had to open it up. There's no GPS. <laughs> so 
we get there and we get to every campus and we meet, uh, we, we were at, at a Yale University and there was a Latina, she was a dean, uh, Dean Sal Salvi Salvide. And uh, we're all, she goes, what's the name of your, your program? I go, I told her, it's Harvard tomorrow. <laughs> she goes, Harvard? We don't like Harvard. <laughs> I'm like, okay. If you ever want to have room, stay here at, at Yale again, you better change that name because we don't, we don't like Harvard. And I'm like, oh, my God, right? Mandona, la señora. Yeah. She was like very direct. The light direct. bulb went off. And I'm like, okay. I go, the following year, I changed it to the Ivy League project <laughs> <laughs> to accommodate, make sure I get room at every university, yes. right? Harvard Tomorrow was the original name. Right, Ivy the original, League project. right. And but, at this time, what is your day job while you're doing all this? I'm, I think I was, I was a seventh grade teacher. So seventh grade teacher, and then this was your... This side was, hustle. This was just side hustle extra. Navarrete comes around and says, let's do it. So I guess what happens on Saturdays? I st we started raising, selling pizza, selling flowers, selling whatever on Saturdays. Yeah. So I was single, didn't have a wife, didn't have three kids. I had a lot of free time. So our goal was to, my goal was only to go for the first time and just to go one time to, yeah. to the East Coast. I, I didn't think that it was going to turn into a second job for me. Um, the following year, we didn't have... Uh, six kids from party. I think we had a total, I think, of 12 or 13 kids, and we went all the way down to New York City. And oh, I drove wow. in New York City, went to the Statue of Liberty, and I went out there. I first saw it. I'm like, I got goosebumps. I'm like, wow. I'm in New York, a Latino kid from a farm working background from Parlier it's in, New in York. the big city, and I'm looking at these big old skyscrapers, right? I'm yeah. like, I'm here. We've arrived. We, we're, and I kept on pushing the envelope. If I took, you know, six kids, Next year, I can maybe take 12 kids, maybe 18 kids. So I started thinking bigger, having bigger vision. The, the, the gap started thinking, you know, from, from 90 degrees to, to 180 to, to 360. Was the district on board? with? The district was on board. Um, uh, my superintendent uh, uh, and our, our board, actually our board president, Jose Espinoza, uh, the godfather of Parlier, that, you know, that gave me the... Uh, the opportunity that opened up the door for, for me and for the kids from Parlier to think yeah. about going. So in year number two, no, year number three, uh, my kids that were sophomores applied, uh, and they were seniors now. Uh, it was Carlos Paz, Ilan Molina, and, and Rachel Navarro, or Beltran. And uh, they they applied, and they, they went to my house, and my I think at the time I was married, my wife and I were, were there, and they applied, and uh, they went to my house, and we were working on their essays and so on, and uh, come April 1st, uh, they announced it, that three parlor kids were accepted to Ivy League universities. There was only seven or eight kids from the Valley. Those were your right? first? Those are my first ones, yeah. Oh, and and yeah. What, what were the schools they went to uh, that first? A Eloy and Carlos went to Yale, uh, and wow. Rachel went to Brown University. Were you there when they found out? Um you know, I, I don't think I was there, but they called me up. And, we and what were, was their reaction? They were screaming. They were, they were crying. <laughs> oh they were crying, God. right? How were you feeling? Oh, God. Man, I was, I was in heaven. I was like... Did you truly believe at the early on that I, it would I did. actually happen? I, I, I knew that they were capable of, of, of getting in because we looked at some other kids that, from the Valley that had gotten accepted to Brown and to Yale and other places, and we saw their writing, and they said... And they were... Our kids even said, you know what? I can write as just as well, if not better, than these other kids, right? Yeah. And then with the nurturing that we had on the side with myself and other people reading their essays, we're like, you know what? It sounds good. Let's take a look, let's take a, uh, a look at it. But, uh, but one of my boys named Carlos um, was the like the uh, uh, rank number one or number two, I believe, in the valley at 132s and in wrestling. And his senior year, you know, we, we were thinking he's going to go to state. Yeah, and I was a wrestling coach at junior high, and he had a different coach in high school. And to his senior year, he decided he wasn't going to wrestle because he wanted to work on his personal statements. And the wow, coach calls me up, serious. says, "Why don't you, uh, Martin? Are, are you aware that you know Carlos doesn't want to uh, call for wrestling?" I go, "Are you sure?" I go, "What are you talking about? We've we've invested six years you know, of, yeah. of wrestling with them, uh, working with them." And he go, "No, I I talked Carlos. I said, What's up?" And he said, "No, I I decided I'm going to work on my personal statements." And I okay, okay, but that guy, that kid was 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 built different. He would go early in the morning, work on his on his SAT prep, on the computer during lunchtime after school. Worked on personal statements. Got accepted at Stanford, Princeton, Yale, Brown, every school except for Harvard. So I asked the admission officer at Harvard. I said, you know, uh, Aurelio, 
can you tell me why you know you didn't accept my boy oh, Carlos? They, you could ask these guys and yeah, I was there. I asked wow. them. I asked a mission officer there, and I said, you know, why didn't why didn't you accept him? And they felt he said, well, we just felt that it was it was going to be very difficult from coming from all Latino high school and going over to to Harvard, right? It's more assimilated, more Anglo, more you know, um, higher income and everything else. And yeah. I said, okay, but I want you to know that he's going to Yale, which is the arch rival for, for Harvard. <laughs> you guys <laughs> lost him. He's going. He to lost Yale. him, but yeah, he's going over. Plus, he joined the wrestling team. He was oh, and he's going to wrestle and pin your guys. Right. He was a he was a top wrestler and uh, one of the uh, top wrestlers in the state of California at that time. Are you still in touch with him? Oh yeah, yeah. He's a dermatologist here in town in Fresno. Really? Yeah. We're gonna have to hunt him down. He's, Jim. Uh, he's uh, does very well. Get him on the and show. he married uh, another Ivy Leaguer. I call him Barbie and Ken. Vivian Velasco Paz. Uh, she's amazing. You ought to have her. Was uh, she from the valley? She's from well? Layton also. Yeah, she's from Layton and Carlos from. Parlier. And they found each other. They, they, they met at an Ivy League, Ivy League function, uh, a uh, one of our uh, Christmas gatherings. We're going to have to bring that power couple in. Oh, you need to. They are amazing. Uh, so anyway. I, like uh, I had to go all the way to Harvard to meet you. Yeah. So Carlos <laughs> gets accepted at all these places. And I every year I, I went down to Yale. I would, I'm to Harvard. I said, oh, guess what? Aurelio, uh, Carlos is doing very well. He's on the wrestling team. He's a 4.0 GPA and doing very well. Sophomore year, junior year, senior year. Senior year, I, I share with them. I said, well, guess what, uh, Aurelio? Carlos will be here at Harvard next year. He'll be going to Harvard Med, right? There's like 13,000 kids that apply. Only, I think, 250 kids at that time get accepted to Harvard Medical School, yeah. the number one medical school in the world. And he's going there. Wow. In his second year, he, he, uh, he gets uh, nominated to, for a Ph.D. program, ends up going with the, uh, earning a Ph.D. and an M.D. from Harvard University. Wow. Parlier boy, right? Parents are farm workers. Um, dad only spoke Spanish. Focus. Mom spoke, you know, both, both what do you languages. Think, what do you think was that special quality that he had? Was it just work ethic? or? Yeah, I think it was a work ethic. We even at, at a, when he was in the seventh grade, I noticed that he was built different. Uh, he was the quarterback. He was only like 5'1". And he had, I had some other uh, players on, you know, uh, Students there were like 5'8", you know, 5'9", 5'10", and he's telling, you know, Joe, Joe, you're the lineman, you're the tight end, you're this, and I'm like, who the heck is this kid, right? He's a very demanding, telling everybody what, what uh, position you're going to play, and I noticed that. I, I just noticed he had this innate uh, leadership, quality. leadership quality, right? I, I, wonder if his, different. I wonder if his hair was standing up when he was a little, <laughs> yeah. little baby. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> that, that, we got to... Uh, that that, that kid was true. built different, man. I tell you. Wow. Uh, but uh, then Rachel, there was uh, Rachel Navarro, uh, who worked uh, after school, become from a single parent uh, household, and uh, and the money she earned, she 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 gave it to her mom, so their mom could pay the rent every year, every month, and put pay, aside all her needs. Oh and, yeah, yeah. And wow. plus she also, you know, she used to work in the district office and. And then do a, she was a flag girl, and she was earning straight A's. And anyway, she applied to UCLA and got accepted there at Berkeley and all the UCs, and but decided to apply to, to Brown and was accepted and, and went to Brown, graduated in four years, and well as Eloy Molina uh, went to wow. Yale University. The okay, following so. year, in the first that first year, I had three kids. The following year, yeah. I didn't have three. I had four kids apply, and all four kids got accepted. Oh, four. Two to Princeton and two to Brown. <coughs> so it's working. Oh, yeah. And then by that time, I had other kids from other high schools that were also coming to my Saturday sessions. The buzz sessions. is out. Oh, the word's out, man. I, you want to go to the East Coast? You want to learn about going to Ivy League universities, how to write their statement, personal statement? Yeah. Come, come with Marti Modest. Right? I, heard long, I heard about you long before I met you. Yeah. People were saying, hey, if you want kids in the Ivy League, you got to talk to this guy, Martin. Yeah. So, I, and so when they said that, I apologize for my uh -huh. assumption, uh -huh. but I thought they were going to send me, Jim, to Martin and Clovis or, uh -huh. or Mart, you know, and, and yeah. they were like, like, no, no, you got to go to Parlier to find it. I go, Parlier for real? Yeah. Parlier. La Colonia? Yeah. La right. Colonia. Yeah. yeah. And there he was. And yeah. I was so proud to hear, you know, especially coming from a smaller community yeah. like Parlier. One and, thing about Parlier individuals that I've met, my cousins are from there, uh -huh. and I, I've actually, you know, played some sports as an adult with some Parlier guys, um, and it, not all of them, but at Rossi, same thing. There's this kind of a chip on your soul, shoulder combined with confidence that they mm -hmm. carry, and it's it's the kind of confidence that says, I don't care where I'm from or where you're from. 
-hmm. We're going to compete and you're going to remember me. And I I didn't Mm -hmm. have that uh, growing up. I I admired that. I wish I would have had that. But I would see these guys and I really admired that they were never afraid of the competition. They didn't care where you were from or whatever. Everybody was on the same level playing field. Right. You had a uniform and so did I. And I didn't have that mindset then, but I admired that about these kids. Where do you think this stemmed from? Was that you think it's a parent parental thing or you think they're just built different? Like you said earlier, I think it comes from, you know, many of our families living, coming from farm working backgrounds um, and the kids working in the fields and the, and the winters and the summers and the hard work ethic. Right. Yeah. You, you know, you got to work with the family. You got to it's a family mindset. You got to work with the family, and um, but I think a lot of the families they they value education, especially in part of your small communities. And yeah, especially coming from Mexico, many of them went to school, but they could be able to continue their education because of of finances, and they had to get a maybe a second job or it was, whatever. It was an extra hand, an extra it? hand, right? And so the whole family would go work. And I, That's I think you, like you, like me, right? Uh, and uh, understanding, yes, you're working now. But during the academic year, you're going to be going to school. You're going to go during the whole year, not yeah. you know, for two weeks you know, for the grapes because we need you for the grapes season or whatever. And then, then you go to school. You miss two weeks out. No. We're, you're going to go from the first day to the end. And then on weekends, you work in the fields or whatever, or you work in the packing houses in the summer. But you've got to take care of business, right? No family Very vacations. Very focused, right? <laughs> uh, there was no family vacations in my, in my home. <laughs> So, yeah. okay, so here, here's what I want to really get to, uh-huh. because this is the part that I think about a lot, and I've never had a chance to ask you about this. Um, you can set up the trip. You have the contacts. There is a fundraising system for this. Mm-hmm. To me, the part that really distinguishes this is how do you get students to believe in themselves to the point where they actually feel like they belong in an Ivy League school. So this is what we do. Um, remember, I, I have m- these monthly seminars. Right? Yes. Uh, from 9 to 12 on Saturdays, once a month. Uh, and I, in fact, I even have some uh, slots right now if anybody's interested. 7th grade or 12th grade, we just ask it to have a 3.5 or GPA or above. But um, what we do is we, we, the first hour is always the soft skills. We, we see, I see a lot of kids that are extremely brilliant, no matter how, I mean, Indian, Anglo, African-American, Latino, everybody. They're really brilliant, but they lack the self-confidence. They lack the ability to believe in themselves totally, right? Yeah. And so um, in the soft skills, we, we teach the kids how to engage people in conversations, how to shake a hand, make eye contact, firm handshake, clear voice, enthusiasm, we practice these. Oh, the big four? Is it the big four? Well, I call it the big five. The big five. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Kings River Elementary. I went to go visit those kids. Well, that's that. I uh, those I, keep, I work with them. So yeah. That group of for over a year. So uh, tell us the big five so that everyone can. So it's uh, it's body posture. Body posture. Uh, eye contact. And we do and we use a, a mnemonic device. We do something like this. Right? Uh, firm <laughs> oh. handshake. Yes. Right? A two, two second rule. Not too tight. Not too Not too hard. No Second, dead fish. One thousand, one thousand two. You're in. You're out. Um, um, uh, clear voice. My name is your first name and last name, loud and clear. And number five is enthusiasm. Uh, when you look at somebody, smile. Fake it until you make it. Yeah. Right. Uh, we do that. And then the other piece is the five W's: who, what, where, why, when, plus how. Tell me more. So when you're in a conversation, we teach these little kids, whether it be in, in second grade, to fifth grade, to high school, right? Um, how to engage somebody in conversation. You walk up to somebody, what should you say? How do you say it? How do you take the initiative to talk to them? Yeah. So now, you know, the kids come in somewhat um, um, confused or don't have the skill base uh, to perform. And by the time they finish, I've had parents uh, in tears crying to me, telling me, Mr. Modest, my son came in, you know, uh, introvert. Now he's an extrovert. Uh, I, we don't even know what happened, right? Uh, the change, the transformation that takes place. So the, that's the first hour. Second hour is the college application. So we'll take the Stanford or the MIT or the Harvard. We'll break down uh, the application. We'll look at the questions. What are they asking for? How do you answer that, right? Uh, so we break that down. And I also, I also give them examples of students' essays. 
so that they can see the flow, the syntax of the essay. Yes. Right? And then, in addition to that, my team of, of uh, my two Princeton grads and my, my uh, Brown University uh, former... Oh, they've come back to help. Yes. I love that. Yeah, I got, I got two of them. Two yes. Princeton Latinas. Uh, they're graduates with master's degrees. Then I have the former director of minority recruitment from Brown University on my team. So and they I like, come and spend these Saturdays with No, you. not with them. Either on Zoom or maybe sometimes in person, but usually on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so I arrange those meetings, or sometimes I even pay for, th- I, I pay for out of my budget to, uh, t- for the ladies to help me uh, review essays. So I'll pay them, you know, so much money to review, you know, one, two, three, four essays out of my own budget uh, so that they have, they, they're giving up their time, right? Yeah. And then the last read, I do the first read, the ladies do the second read, and then the third read is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hart, who's a director, who was a former director of admissions with a PhD from Harvard. Uh, worked wow. 30 years, 30 years uh, in admissions at Harvard, Dartmouth, and Brown University. And she helps you. Oh, yeah. So yeah. if anyone would know, right? Oh, yeah. She knows the inside scoop. Remember, oh, I told you, when I, when I want to win, I want to win. I, know. I want to surround myself with people that have, a, have accomplished and do well. And I got to share with you, we have over, right now, we have over 361 kids that have been accepted from the Valley, mostly from the Valley, uh, to Ivy League universities. Uh, mostly Ivy League, we, some of them are maybe Georgetown, MIT, some other very selective universities. Um, but um, we, we have a, we have a, a, a a goal and objectives. The third hour is is our professional guest speakers. So it might be Dr. Hart who from Brown University will talk to the kids for an hour and the yeah. parents on a Zoom call. Or it might be uh, you know Dr. Paz or like Vivian Velasco or or Erica Gonzalez, the district attorney from Visalia. Um, is that your friend, Jim? I thought you had an Erica Gonzalez that you went to Rosie High. Yeah, but she's a Piedra now. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's more actually from Rosie too. Yeah, I went to University oh. of uh, Davis, no Stanford, and then Davis Law School. Wow. Yeah, sure, sharp. I got these sharp um, m- amount of uh, mostly Latinos, not all of them. Um, but um, so the third hours are professional guest speakers that we we zoom with, or they come and speak to our kids about uh, the importance of, of leadership. So every every month there's there's three strands. Uh, so you ask me, how do we instill? We instill it by for them to get to see get to hear and then when they go on the trip they get to see for example let's say latino students at harvard at yale at brown every every night's a different group right and they're talking real. to them say I'm, I'm i'm from the same high school i went i had the same teacher wow. i grew up in the projects right so my powerful pa- my yeah. parents my parents didn't have a high school or a, a, a phd like some of my roommates yeah right my 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 parents didn't give me a bank like the, the kid from from china the dad gave him a, a, a bank for his birthday <laughs> <laughs> That's a real story. <laughs> so that so you yeah. kind of eliminate yeah. the excuses and the and you, then, you know one of mine and mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember this but you know we grew up Jim and I were both Oakland well Oakland Raiders I'm sorry Raiders the Las Vegas right uh-huh. one of my big heroes growing up was Tom Flores yeah. because he was a head coach of a yeah. Super Bowl winning team right. and Latino and then everybody said no this is not only is he Latino but he's from Sanger oh yeah. And I just thought to myself, so what's my excuse? Mm-hmm. Guests don't have any more. Yeah. And that's what you're giving these kids. Right. We're, wow. we're, we're, we're developing a sense of possibility. Yes. We're telling our students that, you know what? Stop the excuses and start working. Yeah. Preparing. So now what I'm doing is that I'm doing what's called the academic game plan. It's called In education, we call it backward mapping. I'm sure you understand. So backward mapping might be you have Harvard as your goal. So what should you be doing as a senior, a junior, sophomore, freshman, ninth grade, eighth grade, sixth grade, fifth grade, fourth grade, right? So on. So what we've done is we develop a, a academic game plan, and my goal is to put it on um, uh, on social media on our website, so that in any language anybody can go on. It's not there yet, but they can go on. Uh, and maybe your you, your your son uh, speaks English, but mom speaks Spanish. But you can go to the website and it'll go, you know, the Spanish translation. You go to sixth grade. What should I be doing between now to get my son into a Harvard or Yale? So a lot of our parents, they don't have the ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars that that uh, that uh, many of my friends charge. Uh, you know, oh, people. to prepare to prep. Prepare. They're they're these coaches, wow. right? 
uh, it got, there's a lot of money. Uh, and you, know, you, you heard about, you know, these the people, these, uh, these movie stars paying. I was going to ask you dollars, about that. Right? Well, to get their kids into these top schools, right? Um, did you were you aware of any of these scandals at the time? I, I did we, you could catch wind of like, that. Kind of like hear about that, but yeah. Ruben brought it to my attention, and it didn't surprise me. You know, the rich have have, have rich friends, and they have connections. They have the net, network. So I was a little angry. I have to well, say, yeah, right. But, but I'm uh, like Martin's trying to do it the right way. We're gonna do it the right way. And then we're, these guys are over here, cheat, just, right? Yeah. Um, but w- what we tell our students is that we tell our students to take care of business. This is our plan of action. This is what you need to be doing. You're just as good as anybody else applying to Harvard or Yale. They're not going to select you to, because it's, uh, it's some special program. They're going to select you because you're special. They want you. A place like Harvard has like 55,000 people applying. Only 1,800 kids are going to get accepted to Harvard. I think a couple of years ago, we had five of our kids from the Valley that were accepted to Harvard, right? Yeah. And I can tell you right now, I mean, they were brilliant, sharp. Uh, great SAT scores, good writers. They were great students. They're four point, you know, four point four, four point five GPAs. Um, they wrote great, great essays, and they have a great story to tell. So, if you're selected to these schools, um, you know, th- there's an imposter syndrome. Sometimes they think, like, well, you know what? I don't have enough money, or I'm not as smart as that other kid. You know, that mom and dad had a he has a PhD and so on. Yeah. Um, but like like Paz, Carlos, um, the first year, you know, uh, two of his roommates, they were both. Uh, Parents were uh, PhDs, right? And his parents were farm workers, right? And, uh, but yet, at the end of the semester, these guys ended up, at the end of the year, they ended up dropping out, and Paz excelled. He went the 4.0 uh, and doing extremely well. What, what was the difference, right? What did, why did Paz, coming from a low socioeconomic background, and Think these so. other kids that were, you know, they had, they, they had great grades and you know, great parents, and they had the money and so on, but it's that drive, that ganas right here. Yeah. You got to have it. Ganas, desire. You got to have the ganas, man. You have to want it. You have to say, you know what? I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. But I tell the kids that you, you, again, you are destined for greatness. And if you apply yourself, great things are going to happen. God has a great plan for you. And, uh, and if God says, if, if uh, Harvard says no, okay, maybe there's UCLA or there's Berkeley or there's another a campus where you're going to feel more comfortable. Uh, I just really believe in divine revelation and, and uh, you know, providence for our kids to, that they're going to go places in a certain place. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, this is crazy. Okay, so uh, what year are you in now? I'm in my 34th year. 34? <laughs> How many kids, I don't know if you know the number uh, off the top of your head, that have, you've helped to get into Ivy League schools or, or we have prestigious over colleges. Three three 361 kids on the East Coast and over two over two thousand kids on the on the West Coast. And when I say West Coast, we're talking mostly UCs, UC UCLA, UC Berkeley, Davis, and Fresno State. Great schools. Oh yeah. Wonderful schools. I, I tell the, the kids, I go, you need to go where, where you want to go, not where your mama, daddy wants to go, or you think Mr. Modest wants you to go. Yeah. You need to go, if you feel comfortable at Davis, then go to Davis, you know? I mean, and look at their programs. Fresno State has a great ag program. They're one of the best in, this, in the whole country. Is that where you, you went to Fresno State? I'm a bulldog, yeah. Yeah, look, he's got I'm, the bulldog. I'm a bulldog, he, baby, right And he's there. rapping. He's <laughs> rapping today, Fresno State fans. Oh, yeah! <laughs> I love Fresno State football. I love, I love, the, I love the dogs. I'm, I'm a, I'm a dog. Go uh, dogs. Yeah. Now, um, as far as now, now you've, you're in your 34th year, right? Mm-hmm. I'm assuming at this point, schools are now coming to you, looking for you. Hey, Martin, you know, can you help us here? Or we got this. Have you had any of these schools oh, yeah. seek you out? I know initially Harvard and uh, Princeton and what was your MIT where you sought them. Yeah. Did you start having other schools say, hey, well, yeah, guys- I get notices all the time about we, we like to invite your your kids from the Ivy League project to uh, do a two or three day um, um, visit visitation. Uh, we want your kids, you know, Martin, um, you know, Princeton called, says, Martin, we, uh, we'd like to do a, a invitation. We'd like to speak to your kids. Uh, there's an organization called Green Lining, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, they they're always sending me information all the time about, you know, uh, you know, Carlton's. Uh, uh, recruiting uh, or, you know, ex-alumni say, hey, Martin, should we reach out to the USC fella or reach out to UCLA or whatever? So I do a lot of California trips sometimes in the summer. We take the little ones, the peewee group, 
Uh, these are kids in first, second, third graders. What? That young? Yeah. So, so <laughs> <laughs> remember, I'm determined, right? Yeah. I, I'm very focused, right? I take the, them and their mom. So we go to UCLA, and then in the afternoon, we go to Santa Monica. How do you right? pick these kids that well, young? These are, I, I put it on my Facebook page, anybody that like to go. And, and, you know, it's interesting is that. You yeah, have one for junior high kids? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, junior high. And, but, preg- uh, they, pregnant moms. Moms that are pregnant. Uh, like, <laughs> unfortunately not. <laughs> not that I know up. of. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, with the little ones, uh, we take them with, with us. Uh, and some of them, you know, parents, some of the parents are you know, PhDs. Yeah. Law degrees and so forth. They, they understand the importance of education, right? And they want to get their kids involved as soon as possible so that when the Princeton admission officer comes in, they want to be there to hear the story, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll be doing a Zoom call later on this month um, with uh, parents that have kids in the first, second, third grade uh, that want to understand what should you be doing. There's a book that I'll be, I'll be utilizing, referencing uh, by my friend uh, Roxanne Ocampo, uh, The Kitsa Mama. Uh, it's a book on a guide for uh, how to get your, get your kids into um, Selective schools. I'm also writing my own book myself. Uh, yeah, I was going to yeah. say that the Martin Mattis book yeah. has to be. <laughs> the Martin Mattis, the From Grapevines to Ivy Leagues. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so uh, right now I want you to, to imagine uh-huh. that somewhere in YouTube land, there's a teenage kid who's not affiliated with your project, mm-hmm. who's thinking about just maybe they might apply to an Ivy League school. What would you say to that kid right now? I would uh, share with the kid and tell him that, that you, again, that you are destined for greatness. Don't let anybody ever tell you you can't do anything at all. Um, you never know what's going to happen unless you make it happen. Um, apply yourself. Be focused. Uh, be engaged with your teachers. Ask them, uh, off, ask them for office hours to talk about the subject matter that you're involved in. Um, so that when the admission officers uh, read the letter of recommendation that the uh, teacher is going to be writing about, the intellectual curiosity that this, you know, Johnny comes to my office and interacts with me and talks to me about, you know, the civic, civil, civil war uh, and the um, rationale about why the, the North conquered the South and the infrastructure and so on. I mean, the most important thing is that engagement piece, right? It, it's one thing to be smart, yes, but it's another it's another thing to understand the admission process. And if you don't understand the admission process, you're going to be at a disadvantage, dis- advantage, right, of, um, of not understanding what you should be doing. So that's why on, the, on our website we're going to develop this, this program where the parents and students alike will be able to get on, get on and understand and read essays of students that have been accepted and, and, and understand what's my action plan, what's the... What should I be doing in terms of backward mapping? Understanding the process from steps of every grade level. So there'll be um, you know, examples of things that they should be doing. Great. Now, we're going to switch this audience member. This imaginary audience member is now a parent mm-hmm. who happened to be on YouTube, and they see the Martin Mares episode, mm-hmm. and they're like, man, this sounds like a great program. How do I get my student involved in the Ivy League project? What would the uh, founder say to that? Well, I would encourage them to go to our website, uh, www.ivyleagueproject.org. It'll be in the description, folks. Yeah. The link will be and, there. And uh, my email, modestvision, uh, M-A-R-E-S, the word vision, at yahoo.com. And I can put that in the description as well? Of course. And my okay. phone number, my sound number, 559-417-4151. Um, and give me a call and... Uh, uh, if we can't, if you can't come to one of our meetings here in the Valley, we can Zoom. Okay. And I, I do a lot of pro bono work, um, especially for, for kids who don't have uh, the means, financial means to, to pay for an hour of thing, most uh, an hour of uh, time. Um, a lot of my work is, uh, you know, you send what you can. If you can't, you don't have any money, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want you to get on my Facebook page because I'm always advertising or sharing uh, uh, financial aid or uh, scholarships yeah. uh, uh, that are available uh, soon, very soon. I think within the next couple of months, we'll have a, on our website, we'll be uh, sharing uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of scholarships available for, especially for first generation, uh, for students that uh, desire to go to, go to college. Nice. Yeah. 
Now, I know because uh, I follow you on social media, and Jim, I don't know if you've ever seen any of his posts, but I want to say about 90% of them end with the catchphrase, network, baby. Yeah. Uh, what is the value of networking for you, and, and why is that your uh, phrase? It's Networking is, is so important for everyone to understand that as a result of networking, if you can provide information to somebody, uh, and be nice about it in a very professional way. Um, it, it's a reciprocal process because people are going to want to bless you. People are going to want to also provide something for you. Um, I always tell people, you know, be a giver first instead of a taker. You Amen. Know, you know, that's important. Can you say that again? Be a giver first instead of a taker. Yes. Uh, because everybody, sometimes all they want is, you know, uh, take, take is, but imagine somebody, I always, I always tell people, what can I do to enhance you to your skills or what can I do? Can I connect you, your son or your daughter? Um, you know, let me recommend these books to you. Yeah. Uh, would you be interested in joining us on a trip to the, to visit Stanford? You know, you um, may not remember this, but when I was in the middle of trying to create that library in London, you would send me names and sources. Okay. Do you remember that? I think I think I did. You help yeah. so many people. You don't even. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I get that, that's how I ran. Yeah. I met you. You, yeah. I heard about you. Then you started randomly. You saw some stuff on well, Facebook. I saw, the, I saw the great work you were doing. You were there Thank to you. empower the community, and it really meant a lot to me because when I see people like yourself that are doers and, uh, and want to change, to have a cha be a change agent in their community, it, it really um, it makes me proud and happy that. People like you are changing the lives of kids. Uh, kids That's who, exactly how I feel about you. Yeah, yeah you know, you're, you're, you need li you're getting library books so that kids can read, right? And the other day when I saw something that you had, I'm like, wow, what if we had, you know, what if we connected them with uh, Apple like we do in Parlier, yeah. right? In Parlier, you know, we got devices. You for have everything. an Apple partner? Apple, Partnership? Yeah, we have, we have Apple. We spent wow. 1.5. I didn't share with you, but I'm also the board president for my school district. And so oh, okay. we have new initiatives like the early college high school so that kids can get their AA degree before they, enter, they finish high school. But we spent over $1.5 million on uh, Apple products for our kids K-12, right? That's uh, awesome. We've been to the Apple Center and so on. It's beautiful. Uh, and a just spaceship so many looking one things. out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just wow. Like, wow. It's like you get there. Like, I, I was like Star Trek, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to, to infinity and beyond. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a... It's a it's a wild place. It's amazing uh, to to see that and to be that right. But I, again, I'm I, I commend you, and I'm I'm one of your biggest cheerleaders. I I, uh, I value you for for making a difference in kids' lives, and especially that library that you do. That's so funny. I feel exactly the same way about you. So, and, and I want to invite you to join me on the Ivy League trip. Uh, and take some kids from uh, New London uh, with us. Oh, I'll man, work on, uh, that would be awesome. I'll work on some uh, scholarships uh, for two or three kids to join us uh, for eight, for the seven days. Wow. It's going to be April the 13th to the 18th. So okay. Put your, put Thank your, you. Uh, put in your calendar if you're interested in joining us as a chaperone. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You have to suffer from Washington to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I've never been to any of those places. Oh, yeah, you love it. Historical sites to... The Harvard, Yale, Brown, Princeton, Columbia, Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building, uh, everywhere. Now, yeah. forgive, forgive me because I, I do have some friends uh, who went to Brown, but mm -hmm. what city is Brown in? In Providence. Providence, Providence Rhode, Rhode Island? Providence, Rhode Island, right. It's okay. the smallest, it's the smallest uh, I think it's the smallest state in the United States, I believe. It's, it's not that big at all. But beautiful. Oh, gorgeous. Uh, it's on a hill. Brown is on a hill and identifies as the uh, safest uh uh, the community, the, yes, uh, safest university in the uh, entire entire United States, and the happiest, I believe, uh, a safe community, the happiest university. That's what it is. Oh, I love that. Beautiful, wow. it's a gorgeous town. Um, but uh, the, the these kids, my, many of them are my my kids have come back. In fact, our, our superintendent, Doctor Rafael Iniguez, our, our, was a uh, University of Pennsylvania graduate and. Today, you know, got a degree from University of Penn, master's from Fresno State, PhD from Fresno State, and today he's our superintendent. Oh, right? man. So it's, and we have a several of these Ivy Leaguers that are back in Parlier working in our community. Um, but, I, you know, I, I could tell them. I said, I need you to get back. I want you to come back and, and um, give back. Be, be a leader in our community. It's beautiful. Yeah. So uh, we want to 
finish this episode off by getting some words of wisdom from you. Um, if you could impart, and this one is not for the parents or the students, but for the potential change maker that may be out there with an idea about how to positively affect their community, but not quite sure how to go about it. What words of encouragement would you give an adult out there trying to become a change maker? Well, I, I, I would look at the, uh, what are the issues? Uh, what are, is the need in that community? What is the need in the community, right? What are the needs in the community? And then again, um, backward map, here's the issue. Uh, and then uh, what do we need to do? Who do we need to include um, in this year or the following year? Break it down in terms of looking at uh, uh, getting a, a group of people, sharing the vision with people yeah. so they understand what they need to do. Exactly what you did, right? Uh, you had the library, and, and you had to break it down. Who do I include? What do I need to talk to so that we can make a change? Uh, so I think that's that's important, especially if, if they wanted to do an Ivy League project or some kind of college program in their state of California here, or they want to do a, somewhere, go back and emulate a program like mine. I, I'm more than willing to share the information and how to do it and spend time. We grab some coffee and on and, uh, um, um, burrito. And uh, we'll, make, we'll make things happen, brother. Make it happen. <laughs> make it happen. Uh, but I want to finish up with three things. There's yes. three things that I think are very important. Mind, body, and spirit. Your mind, we have to, be, have to be keen. You have to be good readers. I tell kids, I need you to read one to three books a month. If you're reading at the fourth book, even better. Uh, so you need to be keen. You, you, we can't be, you know, yes, you can look at your, your, your telephone and so on, but you need to be well-read. Uh, every 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 day, and you got to read, read, read. Uh, what what happens? I see a lot of our kids that they are they're on their phones, but they're not reading. Uh, back in the day, they you know they were saying, "Well, I'm reading on my phone, whatever." Maybe a hard book, and maybe it'd be more conventional. Um, the second item, my body is we have to get out and exercise every day. That's important because um, the the research will show that. Those people that are working out have better, higher grades than those that don't work out, right? Oh, really? It yeah. academically translates. Right. Because the brain there's is a alert. Rela- there's, a, there's a relationship. And then the third aspect is a spiritual aspect. And I, I encourage your kids to have a relationship with God Almighty, to read the Bible, Amen. to go to church, uh, to understand who your maker is, and to have a relationship with God Almighty, uh, to go and, and read the Bible, to uh, to attend church, uh, a gatherings and so on, and to you know really establish that 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 quality time when you're talking to God Almighty in your in your uh, in your time, right? The daily, the daily. You know, we eat food. Uh, you know, uh, we need spiritual food daily, right? Because we're always feeding the the, the body. But what about yeah. the soul? We got to feed the soul. Yes. So those are the three aspects that I always share with our students all the time. Wow. Yeah. So again, Martin Maris with the Ivy League project talking about mind, body. And soul. Mm-hmm. Before we leave, though, can I get a karate chop? We can do a karate chop. We just stand up, and we're right. going to pick up our feet. All right, we're going to do it right here, Jim. A karate chop. Here we go. Oh, you got to gotta pick up your foot. Don't fall down on me, brother. <laughs> here we go. Yes. You're right, so go. you're going to pick up that, that, that foot. I'm going to pick up my right. The count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Hi-ya! All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a. That's a first for Rob Live. (laughs) Until next time, everybody, it's love, peace, and chicken grease. I'm Rob Live, and we're out.